of technology and philosophy, sort of understanding what things really mean and how they really work. Uh, he's one of the few people who can step back from the minutia and look at the big patterns, and then next day dive deep, deep into the technology itself. Uh, Dave is currently the SVP of Platform Engineering for Warner Music Group, uh, where he's helping to transform the music industry as well. Dave? Hi, so I'm going, to, uh, I'm going to talk today a little bit about the origin of data gravity. Uh, data gravity is a concept that I came up with uh, a few years ago. Uh, it was primarily trying to describe what, uh, what we were seeing with cloud and, uh, and actually in some of the larger data centers. Uh, you would see this uh, kind of accumulation of large amounts of data and that, that data seemed to then attract uh, things like applications and services uh, closer and closer to it. And so this pattern that I saw, I, I started to uh, try and, and put more of a thought behind why that was. And so uh, originally, uh, we had this effective pattern of a massive data that seemed to accumulate. And really, what, uh, what you gained by moving the application closer to that massive data was a, a benefit of either a combination of lowering the latency uh, and or uh, increasing the bandwidth. So you could get your stuff faster or you could get more stuff. Uh, and this is really a function of, of time and distance. That's really the concept of, uh, of data gravity in a nutshell. Uh, as these applications interact, uh, you end up creating more data. So by using and interacting with the data, it creates more data, uh, and that's a pattern that we see. Now, what's interesting is you also have the idea of services, and so in clouds like Amazon and, uh, and such, what you'll see is that uh, you have services which are really the same thing as an application, except you have an interface that allows other computers to talk to the logic instead of uh, a user interface, which would be something that you would use for a traditional application. It's an easy way of looking at things. If you look, we have two arrows. Uh, one is labeled acceleration. So there's an accelerative effect as, you, as the application moves closer and closer to the data. Uh, the, the idea is that it wants to benefit from that uh, lowering of latency and increase in bandwidth. Uh, at the same time, uh, once you enter a certain area, there's a, a level of pull of trying to move away, and that's the escape velocity. So uh, to move your application or service or something like that further away from the data uh, is actually a difficult task, uh, especially if you've designed your application or service to make assumptions um, on how quickly it's going to get a response uh, or how much data it can send and receive. These are, these are effects of data gravity. There's also a concept of terminal velocity. So at some point, you are so close to the data or you have the data with you that uh, you're not really benefiting any further by being closer to the data. If you're already running on the system where the data is, uh, it's going to be very difficult for you to benefit unless there's a change in, say, hardware or something like that. For example, when we move to uh, solid state disk drives, uh, that obviously could increase the gravity of a single system. This is, uh, this is what data gravity is. Uh, the idea behind this talk is to actually uh, answer a question that, uh, that had been bothering me once I, uh, once I developed the concept of data gravity, and that is what's the origin of data gravity or what really causes data gravity? Uh, this was something I struggled with along with several other questions, and over the past year, uh, I I started to uncover what, uh, what led me to believe that there was a, a deeper cause for all of this. And so, uh, delving in a bit further, uh, the realization was uh, that there's a difference between some of these things that we use interchangeably. So you have data. Uh, data isn't what, uh, what all of us think of necessarily uh, as data. We use data interchangeably with all sorts of different things. Uh, data is really something like a number, like 32. Uh, that's a bit of data. Uh, 
It's a number. We know a few things about it, but not a whole lot. But that is data. That would be something you might find in a traditional relational database. You might find it in a NoSQL store. Uh, you can find it anywhere. That's a bit of data. Uh, it's not very useful. Uh, you know it's 32, and that's about it. But uh, if we add some context to it, um, and we begin, to, uh, we begin to define what that 32 really means with some semantic uh, information as well, it becomes information with that addition of context. So this is really where we move from data to information. Uh, people tend to use data and information interchangeably as the same thing, but they're really different. Uh, these are different things. Um, they benefit from one another, but they're not the same. If we go a little bit further, um, information becomes knowledge when we leverage previously accumulated information. Uh, and so if we think about the 32 degrees Fahrenheit, and then we add the fact that we know from the past that this is a measure of temperature, that it's cold for people, water freezes, it creates ice, there's all sorts of other information that we already know uh, once we know that, uh, that it's 32 degrees that we're talking about based on previous experience. And uh, if, we, if we take it one more step, uh, if we know it's 32 degrees Fahrenheit outside today, uh, because of this I will wear a coat because it's cold and I don't want to be cold. So we end up taking action based on the combination of the information and the knowledge. And we end up being able to take, uh, take an action that will be beneficial. And so I started to think about this flow and how this would affect things. And, and the realization I came to was after I take that action, uh, there's potentially new knowledge created. Uh, there are all sorts of interesting interactions uh, between these things. And so as I began to think more and more about, well, how, how does this really work? Uh, if, if I'm moving one way and I can move from data to information to knowledge to action, uh, what, what happens then? What I realized is that these are really feedback loops. These are loops that, uh, that are cycles that go to one another and actually provide additional bits of, of information, additional data points, um, and these are cycles. And uh, at first I thought, well, action would feed back to knowledge, knowledge could feed back uh, and create information, and from information you can derive additional data. Uh, this wasn't quite it though. Uh, what it did do is have me realize that these are all loops, so all of these things have the potential to interact with one another. So really, uh, action can spawn new data, new information, and new knowledge, or any combination. And a simple bit of data applied to some existing knowledge can create action. All of these combinations uh, are, are valid, uh, and you can control these. So you may choose to control when you want to filter one of these feedback loops. These are cybernetic feedback loops, by the way. This supplies uh, uh, a framework for how a whole lot of different things work, and it's a pattern that uh, has been identified in different ways by different people, uh, actually over a very long span of time. Uh, and so uh, this is also, if you are familiar with the idea of entropy, um, I define entropy as, uh, as a change in uncertainty. This is more of a uh, information theory definition than a physics uh, thermodynamic definition. Uh, but if you think of these as changes in certainty, if you think about when you move through those loops, uh, so if we, if we look back, uh, you'll see if you're flowing backwards uh, or if you're flowing forward, the only time you can move from one stage to the next is if you've had a change in uncertainty. So if I've, if I've reduced the uncertainty, I've created information. And if I change the uncertainty again by applying it to knowledge, it's going to be what spawns me to take action. If there's been no change probabilistically, then I'm gonna have no reason to take an action because I've gained nothing. It's classic information theory. If, if you've gained nothing, no nothing has really been communicated, so why would, why would anything change? At first I thought it was between, but uh, it really is throughout. So all of these things are changes in uncertainty. Um, it may increase, it may decrease, but it's a communication of some type that you're gonna learn from. So uh, those of you who are familiar with OODA, uh, OODA loops, 
Uh, this is uh, observe, orient, decide, and act. There was a guy named John Boyd. He identified this pattern. This is used by, uh, or has been in the past, used by the military. They're actually trying to evolve beyond this now. Uh, but the idea is you observe or you uh, gather information, uh, you orient yourself, uh, actually you're supposed to orient yourself to your opponent, uh, and then you're, ideally, uh, you make an unexpected decision that they will not be able to anticipate, and that's when you're in their decision loop, that's the decide piece, and when you do that, you take an action. And as you do that, uh, at least as Boyd postulated, you, you get into their decision cycle of your opponent. Well, if you're able to get into the decision cycle of your opponent, um, you can beat them because your time to act shrinks and theirs expands because they're disoriented. So that's how the military uses OODA loops. It's still a set, it's a decision cycle. Uh, these are feedback loops as well. It's the same pattern. Interestingly enough, uh, there's another version of this pattern, PDSA, which is uh, also known as uh, PDCA. So PDSA is Plan, Do, Study, and Act, and PDCA is Plan, Do, Check, Act. Uh, these are based on Schuert and Deming, uh, and this is where the concept of the Toyota Way, applying uh, the scientific method to, uh, to business process, this is where all of this come from, comes from. Uh, it follows the same cycle and pattern. So this pattern applies throughout. So we have data, information, knowledge, and action. And this pattern uh, actually has loops inside of it. So to actually process and deal with the data, uh, you are you're actually going through cycles. The same applies to the other three, information, knowledge, and action. These cycles are secondary cycles that live inside. And the faster you can move through these cycles, the more advantaged you are. So, Keeping that in mind that we have our cycles, if we apply that in a different way to data applications, interfaces, and actions, uh, you see that this can be applied to compute as well. It's the same thing. You have data, uh, data is data. Application is actually the, the context and things that we need to interpret the data that exists. Uh, the interface is predefined knowledge that we're then embedding and working with our application, and the action is action. If you're taking an action, you're doing something, and it ends up creating additional feedback. Uh, all of these things, again, are simply cybernetic feedback loops. So if we take that, you notice uh, back to my reference that we're trying to do time. So we're dealing with time. Uh, time is always what is against us. Uh, so if you think about it, we are trying to move as quickly as we can through these uh, so that we can be advantaged to take action. If you take action first, it's an advantage. So shrinking this is always to our benefit. Um, and if we look at it, it's also shrinking the actual loops themselves. So data gravity is the effect of trying to shrink that cycle, reduce the cycle time between the data and the application, or between moving from having just data to having information that's available. And something that people don't think about is that we're actually all in the IT industry, we're not in the data industry. Um, we'd all, we all say, oh, there's data, there's big data. The reality is uh, businesses don't care about data, they care about information because information is what you can apply to knowledge to take action. There's a very, very big difference there and that's why we're in information technology, not data technology. Uh, that gets lost, it gets lost all the time and uh, I would stress data is not information. You can create information from data um, but they're not the same. So, if we go back to the original slide, we have this mass of data that we're benefited by dealing with the network. The closer the application moves to the mass of data, uh, the more advantaged we are because we can shorten that cycle time. So if we can speed up uh, the time in which we can move between the two, there's an advantage. This is actually what drives uh, data gravity. This is the origin. Um, I'm going to be doing a lot more work around this. I'll be doing a lot of blog posts and other things describing this a bit deeper. This is, this is kind of the 15-minute talk of probably what's 10 hours of content. Um, but conceptually, uh, this is where the origin of data gravity comes from. Thank you. <laughs>